Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to repair and restore an old audio signal generator from the 1950s era. So it's about time that we start populating the old time workbench with some test gear so that we can start repairing modern and antique gear. So this will be one of the pieces that we're going to use to do that. Now I've got lots of old test equipment and what I'm going to do is repair all of this stuff and we'll cycle through a lot of this older test gear on that bench so you can get an idea of what this older test gear works like and how to get familiar with this kind of stuff. So there's lots and lots of repairs and restorations on the way. So let's get started on this one and get the ball rolling. This is the ICO Model 377 audio signal generator that we're going to repair, restore and bring back to life today. Now this audio generator is from the earlier days of ICO. It still has the blue color scheme on it. And I have some other test gear made by ICO with this blue color scheme as well. So we'll go through all of this stuff and it'll be kind of a neat looking setup for the old time workbench. Now we're not going to just stick with ICO stuff. We'll cycle through Heathkit stuff and all sorts of different types of test gear. But we'll go through these ones first just because they have the same look. And we'll start with the 377 here. Now, this isn't classified as an audio signal generator, but it does go to 200,000 cycles. So if you're working on some older radio gear that has an IF frequency that's under 200K, you could very well use this audio signal generator to align it. Now, of course, 200K is well beyond the audible region. Most, you know, young people can hear just below 20 kilohertz somewhere. That would be on the top scale right here. So you can see how far beyond 20 kilohertz that goes. So it's uh, it definitely exceeds the audio signal generator area. And I guess that would have been a selling feature for way back when. And if that's not good enough, it does sine waves and square waves as well. So I imagine the circuit in here is pretty heavily coupled to this output section. And we'll take a look at the design here in just a moment when we open up the unit and go inside. They were nice enough to stagger the colors for the bands, just to keep things nice and easy to read. So you can see the first bottom scale here is just a logging scale. We have A, B, C, and D. So A is red, so you would follow A, which is this one here. And then B, you can see right here, is the blue. And then C, again, is red, and then D is blue. So they kind of staggered it so that the scale is easy to track. Now the later machines, they didn't do that. It was just all one standard black color, kind of a black and silver design. So. You could kind of see maybe they were trying to keep up with times and they're just trying to you know, amend the way that the unit looks to make it look a little bit more modern or who knows, maybe even they were just cheaping out. So that's a, a pretty standard thing for a lot of companies as they move along. So I really don't know. If you have an ICO model 377 with the silver face, you can compare it to what we see inside this thing and you can determine whether that is the issue or not. So we have an on and off switch here. And a jewel light here, a ruby light on the top, which will look really nice when it's lit up. Some nice binding posts here and a gain control. So that's pretty much it. Things are smooth and feels like everything's working. I imagine there's some large variable capacitor in there. In a moment, we'll find out when we get inside this thing. Now inside this, there really is no line cord or anything. So we can see that it, uh, you know, it's been clipped off at some time. Why it's been clipped off, I really don't know. But we'll find out here quite shortly. We'll get inside and check it out. The case itself is in pretty nice condition. So I'm hoping it looks the same inside. So let's open this thing up and find out. To get inside here, it's relatively simple. I just have to remove these screws around the face and there's one screw on the rear and this whole thing should come right out of the front. I have all the screws removed out of the front of the unit except for one and I've also removed the screw on the rear. So I'll remove this screw just like this. It's probably going to fall. Oh, stuck to the screwdriver. That's nice. And this should just fall forward like this. If we look at it from the side, you can see it pretty much just slides out like this. So what I'm going to do is just move this back this and get rid of the case that down there and as you can see inside it's not looking too bad it's not looking great either you can see here the tubes and the variable capacitor some sort of interesting thing going on over here and if we look at the other side 
Yeah, we can see that there's something very interesting happening with the chassis here, the coating. Looks like something's happened with the coating here. It doesn't seem like it's rubbing off or anything. So it's blackened, the coating is blackened, which usually means a bunch of things, and there is some rust on here. So what I'm going to do, so we can get a better look at this, is I'm going to mount the camera in a different position. We'll take a look down at it, and we'll have a better overview of what's going on here. Here's a closer view of the top side of the chassis, and the first thing I notice is it's been tested June 4th, 1950 something or other. So that looks like either a 3 or an 8. I'll call it a 3 because of the blue color scheme on the face of the unit. And this is, you know, an earlier version. So we'll call it June 4th, 1953. You can see it has 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 vacuum tubes. Way more tubes than I was expecting to find in this little ICO audio signal generator. 5 tubes means it's bound to be good. You see that we have a four gang variable capacitor here. Really nice capacitor. Could be used for a lot of neat projects, antenna tuners and things like that. But it's staying in here and we're gonna restore this unit and bring it back to its, uh, its happy old self again. Nice little coupler here. Bunch of capacitors here. This is obviously the power supply area and they've got a shield here, power transformer, rectifier tube, filter and reactor down here. Now, one of the things that makes this restoration kind of interesting is you can see this is this is a cadmium coated chassis and you can see that it's rusted through over here and you can already see what's happening here. Well, it gets even more ugly over here. You can see there's this blackened over here. I don't know what's been happening over here. And as we look at this side, it gets really bad. Of course, now this is the area that gets really hot and it's going to, you know, pull air through this area and as you can see it's definitely done that this is a blackened cadmium coating now there's a a bunch of things that can cause this to happen first of all the prep to the chassis alone can cause this to go black if it's you know contaminated the actual the chemicals that they're using but what tells me that this happened later on is there's shadowing happening so you look at the transformer here, you really can't see it. I'll remove the shield. There's a shadow of the transformer here, and you can see that it's kind of shadowed with the capacitor here. Now, way back in the day, it was really common for these things to be on, you know, service benches, and they would service auto radios. So in order to have the power supply for an auto radio, you need a 12-volt battery, usually, and a charger. And if the battery is off-gassing or charging beside this, What's going to end up happening is those fumes are going to go in here and it's going to blacken the cadmium. Now you can see that this does not come off. You see there's some surface dirt there, but this will not come off. You can see it's just part of the coating. Getting this blackening off of the cadmium, and you can see it's even gone right through the cadmium and it's rusted here right down to the metal. The only way to get rid of this is it has to be completely removed. Now, the thing with cadmium is it's very, very toxic. If you want to remove cadmium, you need to have the proper mask on and needs to be done in a well-ventilated area. And it's kind of looking like in order to restore this thing, you know, and make it look decent and most likely function properly, I am going to have to remove that cadmium. Look at how bad it is on the bottom. It almost looks like a transformer has, has smoked up here. You can see this on here. You know, and look at the chassis, it's all black. But again, this was really common on service benches to have a 12 volt battery for servicing those radios. And it was probably sitting right next to this thing. Another thing that really gives that away is you can see the studs of the screws are rusted like this, yet the chassis is just spotty. So yeah, it just, it just screams. Car battery has been sitting beside this thing. See down here, it's gone right through the cadmium coating. Even if you were to try and clean this off, and if you were to, you know, get a kind of a, an okay result, you'd still have all of this rust and everything. So what that means is most likely I'm going to take everything off this chassis, and I'm going to probably sandblast this or glass blast this chassis and put a, a coat of cold galvanizing or something like that on this just to protect the chassis. Now, again, you know, if you're going to ever sandblast or glass blast any kind of a cadmium chassis, it needs to be done in a well-ventilated area and you need to wear the proper you know, respiratory pr protection. You need to have a mask on because this stuff is extremely toxic. You definitely never want to breathe any of this stuff in. 
It would sure be nice if the entire chassis looked like this down here, you know, would make things a, you know, a lot easier on my end, but you know what? I'll bring you through the entire cleaning process and the, uh, and all that kind of stuff as well. So it just gives us more stuff to do in this video. You see how it's all over the place and it's most likely under the controls here and things like that. You can see that it's, you know, surrounding tube sockets down here, so it might even be affecting connections. So it definitely, you know, even if you were to try and polish this off, yes, chances are this is underneath here. So yeah, it really just needs to be, everything needs to be removed and it just needs to be cleaned properly. Now, looking at the actual circuit design itself, you can see that we have an oscillator here. This is an, an audio oscillator and we have a light bulb in this audio oscillator circuit. Now, I know everybody from Patron is yelling at the circuit. I recognize the circuit already. We built the solid state version of this oscillator with an op amp over there. And this would be the tube version of that oscillator. And this is a pure example of circuit recognition. We see a light bulb. We know that we have an oscillator in here. We know the name for the oscillator right now, and I'm sure some of you are yelling it at the screen, if not typing it right now. So we'll talk about this circuit and the name of the oscillator here in just a little bit when I get the schematic out. You can see here that there's a lot of caps that are going to need to be replaced. These are definitely going to be shot. All of these caps, these are, you know, all waxies. This one here looks like it has gotten really, really hot. And in fact, the wax is gone in this area right here. There is no wax there at all. So it's gotten so hot that the wax is rolled off to this end. Because you see the capacitor's on a bit of an angle. You see that it's just rolled right off here. So chances are, this is probably close to being a jumper. So, you know, lots of issues here that need to be solved. There's a lot of roundies resistors in here. So we'll go through and check those. Another capacitor here that's going to have to go. So lots of things. This light bulb is going to be a special light bulb because it's in the oscillator circuit. Obviously this is going to be used as something with a positive temperature coefficient. Again, when we take a look at the schematic, I'll explain a little bit more about that oscillator there. So quite a bit of work ahead of me. I have to remove all the wires from the transformer. You see the line cord has been cut. It looks like it's been twisted up here or something. It's pointing over this way at any rate. So let's see over here. Yeah. He's hooked up the switch. Looks like it's in okay condition. There's a bulb in there. This is running up over here. This capacitor on here. So looks like a 10K resistor across the jacks. So these cans are going to have to be substituted as well. Might do that with those little ceramic standoffs that I've done in the past here. So quite a bit of work to be done here. Down here is an adjustment that somebody's comfortably plastered a bunch of red paint over it. Looks like that's have to carve that off of that control. So lots of work. So that's what I'm going to do now. Basically, in order to remove everything from this chassis, what I'm going to do is get a drill and drill out the rivets on the bottom side here so don't damage the chassis or the tube sockets. So I'll drill out all the rivets on the tube sockets. And as you can see, there's nothing really soldered to the chassis itself. Everything goes to a, a terminal tie strip soldered to that, and that's pop riveted or you know, screwed to the chassis or something like that. So in order to get all of this out of here, I basically have to remove the, the reactor, the transformer, desolder the wires. And whenever you're doing this, it's a really good idea just to take a picture of this. So if you have a phone or if you have a basically a notebook or something like that, snap a picture of this. And then that way, take a bunch of different angles. And uh, when you want to put it back together, it goes back together really easy. For example, if you wanted to remove this capacitor here and you wanted to remember where the wires go, clip it just a little a ways away from the, the terminal here and leave a little bit of the wire color on. So it, basically this will run right up there and tells you right where they used to go. You just skin a little bit of the wire, take some of the uh, insulation off and away you go. Now, again, because everything is basically riveted to this chassis, there's nothing really soldered to the chassis. When I drill out the, the rivets here on the tube sockets and everything and remove the controls off the face, all of this stuff that you see here is just going to lift right out. So it looks like an incredible amount of work, but really it's not going to be that, you know, that incredibly bad. So a little bit of work ahead of me here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get started on this and I'll basically get the chassis bared and we'll take a look at that. I'll blast it. We'll take a look at that and I'll put some cold galvanized coating on the, on the chassis here and get everything ready to reinstall here. And then we'll take a look at the schematic and move on from that point. 
In order to remove the face on this ICO 377, it's relatively simple. First, we gotta get rid of the chicken head knobs. They're called chicken head knobs because they look like chicken heads. Now, usually these are pretty easy to get off unless they're seized up. That's pretty loose. This one here is a little bit tougher to get off. There it is. Usually what ends up happening with knobs that are on switches, wafer switches, is sometimes they slip. So what they do is they score the shaft and then people tighten the screw up tighter. And then sometimes they loosen off again and they score the shaft and then it puts a ridge on the knob and then sometimes they're harder to get off. So you loosen the screw up and just turn it until it kind of smooths the ridge. Then they pop off. So that was relatively easy. Now, the next thing that I want to do is loosen up this switch, and I'm going to also need to remove this. Well, the jewel light itself will probably come out when I remove the nut on the backside. We'll see here in a moment. So you want to be very careful with your pair of pliers that you don't score the face of the unit. So just set it down and very gently give the ring a pinch, and it should just loosen up. I can feel the switch itself on the other side. There we go. It'll switch moving, so sometimes it also helps to just hold the ring and then move the switch on the other side and then let go of the ring and then put the pliers on again and then move the switch so you're kind of making a ratchet motion and that way you don't score the face of the unit. This is nice and clean and I want to keep it like that. So on the back side of the unit here, we have a incandescent dial light. We'll just take that out and we'll take a look at this here. There we go. Nine sixteenths. Take that off. Pretty standard. Usually always nine sixteenths. That's why I have all the tools ready. It's always a good idea to put the nut back on the back side of the little jewel lamp so that you don't lose the nut. It's a really nice looking little jewel lamp there. You can see it's got a really nice color to it. When the incandescent bulb was glowing behind that, it'll look really nice. And on this side, you can see here that there's two one little quarter inch nuts that need to be undone. So I'll do those. Get this over here like so. And once you're done with these again, when you take these off, you're going to also want to get all the little pieces together, keep them together. So you can see that there. And then put this on this side like so. Just tighten it on there like that. It's good enough just so you don't lose the pieces. And the bottom side here is tightened right here. Kind of the same way, except there is no spacer on the back side because this has just got a Somewhat of a locking tab here. Move that. A little bit of a lock washer on the back side with a connection on it. Like a terminal tie lug here, right here. So that's all loose. And then the last thing to do is remove these right here. And those look to be half inch. I'll see if I can open these with. Uh, this here, 13 mil, is close enough. Put it on here, and just like that, they're loose. So one there, a little washer here as well. It's handy to have a little bucket to put these in, so that way you don't go losing any of the parts and pieces. And this here, like so. I think after this, we're probably ready to remove the face. Let's see, unless there's something else holding this thing on. Doesn't look like it. So there we go. And it comes off just that simple. Put that down there for now. So we're just about there. So the next thing that we're going to do is, I guess I could probably remove this shield here that shield will most likely come off. 
quarter inch driver. As you can see, I'm really prepared to do this. I wasn't planning on taking that off here, but we'll do that right now anyways. So there's a screw here, or a nut I should say, on the bottom side. I'll remove that. There's a magnet in there, so it'll hold it in. And another one over here. That looks like there's one more down here. And this one is really rusty. Yikes. So they'll all be stuck in the end of this thing. Nice thing about magnets is it holds them in there. Be able to get that out with a small screwdriver. And this will allow me to show you that. Yeah, you can see that there, how it's kind of created that shadow with the transformer here that I was talking about earlier. So it's definitely some some form of nasty corrosion there. So just get this out of the way. You can see how quickly this is basically stripping down. So the next thing I'm going to do is remove this. I'll do this off camera. I have to desolder the wires on the bottom side and mark everything at any rate. So take the screws out for this transformer, remove that. There's two here for this as well. Again, marking the wires to where they go. And it'll be the same for the capacitor because the capacitor will have to come off of here and at that point it's pretty much ready just to drill the rivets out on the bottom side of the sockets here and that's what I'm going to do and once I have everything ready pretty much just to come out I'll show you how that comes out it'll just be like a big wiry mess that'll come out and when I want to put it back in the chassis the big wiry mess will just fit back in now I'm not going to change any components in here until I get everything mounted back in the chassis here again just because that's just going to lessen confusion. So everything will still be attached, everything will still be hooked up, and then once everything is basically screwed back down to the chassis again, then I'll start going in here and start replacing all the components. That'll make things much easier. The last thing I would want to do is remove all this and then start changing out parts and pieces with this you know, wiry mess on the bench. That would, uh, you know, definitely create a whole lot of confusion. It just keeps it nice and simple so we can you know, keep track of what we're doing kind of piece by piece. The power transformer, inductor, reactor, and all that has all been removed. This is the capacitor here. You see there's hardware all over the bench here. I'm just going to replace all the screws because a lot of these were really rusty. So there's the capacitor there. I've also drilled out all of the rivets on all of the tube sockets. Then I've loosened up the nut on this VR here. So I've also drilled the rivets out on the terminal tie strips. Pretty much everything that's been holding something down on the chassis here has been loosened up. This was held down by a screw and a nut. This is the, uh, the bulb on the bottom side here. So as you can see, I just have to gently kind of pull everything through. Hopefully this will come through. That yeah, does. But I might have to desolder that. There we go. There it is. Pretty much just the way it was in there. But now... I'm left with a bare chassis that I can clean up. So I still have to get some of the rivets out of the top here. I just push them through with a center punch from the bottom side. They've all been drilled. And I'm pretty much ready to sandblast the chassis. Now again, this has a cadmium coating on it, so I have to wear protection. And of course, the um, outlet for my sandblaster is going to be blowing outside far away from where I am, so you can never be too incredibly careful. So you need the, the proper mask and uh, all the proper precautions to work on something like this. You definitely don't want to be inhaling any of this dust. Very, very toxic. The chassis has now been glass bead blasted, and it's pretty much ready for the next coat. Now, before I go about putting the next coating on this, I'm going to use brake cleaner. Make sure that there's no wax or oils on the surface. Even me handling this is going to put some oils on the surface. And down the road, that can cause the next coating to come off. So I want to make sure that this is nice and clean. And as you can see, the shield for the power supply has also been done. So it's nice and clean as well. So 
well on the way to getting all the components put back on the underside here again. Sure, it'd be nice if I could leave the chassis like this. It sure looks nice like this, but unfortunately, in short order, this will start to rust. In fact, it's actually kind of amazing how fast a glass bead blasted metal surface will rust. This will rust in no time. In some cases, when you sand blast or glass bead blast cast iron, you can glass blast a thing 20 minutes later, it's brown. So it really just depends on the environment you're in and everything like that. So this is staying nice and clean looking. This is done about uh, 15 minutes ago. So it's still nice and clean. So I'll get through the rest of the process here. And when I have the thing coated, I'll be back and I'll show you what that looks like. Here's a look at the chassis with the cold galvanizing compound on it. Everything turned out really nice. And at this point, I'm pretty much ready to put all the components back in the chassis and mount everything back on the top here. So what I'm going to do is start with mounting the transformer and the inductor. And I'll put the capacitor on here and I'll get all the larger components on the top side here. And then I'll mount all of that wiry mess on the underside back in and then I'll basically fold the tube sockets back down. And I'll use 632 screws to mount the tube sockets back. So I've got a bunch of stainless hardware and I'm going to use the stainless screws, nuts and star washers to hold everything to the chassis. So it should look really nice when it's all done. Oh, here's the, uh, the shield for the power supply as well. That turned out really nice. The chassis reassembled with ease and it looks great with all the stainless hardware holding everything to this chassis. While all the components were off the chassis, I used that opportunity to clean them all up with a mild detergent as well. That includes the face and the backside here. Here's a catch that gets quite a few people. Some very mild household detergents that you would never suspect attack aluminum. And I mean attack it. For example, you spray it on the backside, five seconds it looks like this chassis. So always test the mild household detergent that you're going to use in a very inconspicuous area before you go about you know, basically putting it all over it. Or you could have a very bad day. So always keep that in mind. Another thing that should be mentioned about this coating that I've used on the chassis here is it gets extremely hard in about three days. Now, while this coating is still soft, you want to make sure that you remove that coating where there needs to be a good ground connection to the chassis or any type of connection to the chassis. For example, this tube retainer ring that you see right here has a little ground lug on the side of it here, and that needs to make really good connection to this chassis. This coating that is on the chassis is an excellent insulating barrier. You need to make sure that it's cleared off in any kind of area on this chassis where there needs to be a good connection to the chassis. So you want bare steel under all of these vacuum tube socket retainer rings, under these little lugs over here that need to make good contact to ground. As you can see, the capacitor over here is not going to be in service anymore, and this one isn't either. They're basically just dummy capacitors that are there for the looks. On the bottom side here, I have some standoffs that have been put on the screws that have been used now on the chassis here. Underneath this capacitor retainer ring, all of that has been cleaned off as well. So all the coating is cleaned off, and as you can see, I have a nice little ground lug here for the new capacitors that are going to be installed on the bottom side of the chassis. Now, all of this wiry mess that you saw that was on the bench here, looks like a big pile of spaghetti, basically just fit right back in and very comfortably settled right down. All the tube sockets lined right up with their holes. All I needed to do was just put in the new mounting hardware and everything fastened in just like you see right here. So if you ever need to basically strip the chassis of any radio or any other piece of test gear or an older television or something like that, you always want to keep this method in mind because it's just that quick. Just slide the whole thing back in and fasten it back in. And if you've taken really good pictures, now you have the map to basically go and recap. And if you want to rewire and change the resistors and everything like that, you definitely don't want to remove any components before you take this that because it, it is really important if you remove all the capacitors and things like that not only will a lot of the tube sockets not be supported properly and they could move around and things like that but when you put the whole thing back together now it's basically like it was before i took it apart aside from you know disconnected caps and things like that so it makes the rebuild very easy just a quick little tip to help you get through that step if your chassis is in really bad condition like this one was now, 
if I knew more about what had actually happened to the coating on this chassis, and I know that it wasn't going to, you know, basically continue to degrade, I could have possibly left the chassis alone, but I really didn't know what that blackening on the chassis was from. And we saw in some areas that the rust had, you know, it was rusting, so it had gone right through the you know, cadmium coating. So, you know, 10 years down the road, something like that, who knows what's going to happen, how far that's going to go. And of course, it could affect the performance of the unit, especially if that, that blackening starts to go under grounding areas and things like that. I could lose grounds and things like that. So the best option in, in a situation like that, when you really don't know what had happened or what kind of chemical was on there, is just to strip it all off and make sure that you're dealing with a good foundation again. Now you can see that I've tacked the wires to this resistor here and I've done that in other places. I know that this resistor goes to a lug on this capacitor and by tacking the wire to the resistor like this, I know that they both fasten to the same place. You're gonna to wanna to do that in certain areas where you know that things need to attach. Like over here, I've got a resistor just tacked to these other resistors here. And I know that the area over here will go to a lug on these capacitors. So basically this resistor will go across these lugs here, you can see these isolated standoffs here are going to support the new capacitors and I'll show you that when they're all installed. Things like that, just prepare yourself. I've twisted these wires together. I know that they both go to the same terminal on the tube socket. And again, you know, I've taken very good pictures of this. So if I need to find out where anything goes, say I've lost place or anything like that, instead of having to follow a schematic, you can just take a look at a picture and you know just very quickly fix the issue now of course if you want to follow the schematic and you know completely redo this at that point that's absolutely fine as well whatever you're into basically when i do something like this i just want to get it back together exactly the way it was before i took the thing apart within limits and then i can proceed on the restoration and it just makes it that much quicker and efficient and you can get through the recapping and you know rewiring process or whatever you have to do at that point so what I'm going to do now is start going through here and I'll remove all of these questionable components. I'm not leaving anything like this in here. These are all going to be at, in some particular point of failure right now. And we'll take a look at them later on a capacitor checker. But, you know, all of these are going to be leaking and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they all got to go. And the resistors, all the roundies, I'll end up checking. And if I find any bad ones, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. You know, we'll take a look at the monometer and things like that. So I'll get through the recapping process right now and all that kind of stuff. And when I got this all cleaned up and pretty much ready to test, I'll be back. For those of you that are subscribed to my channel, you'll know that I talk about this particular style of resistor here and this particular style of resistor here in some of my videos. For those of you that are new to my channel, this particular piece of equipment is such a good example of the failure point in this particular style of resistor that I'm just going to go over that again and give you a really good example of why these resistors fail and what they do when they fail. So again, if you are new to my channel and you're into restoring this older type of gear or even modern solid state stuff, I have a huge list of videos and in each video, I try to improve your troubleshooting techniques and show you the failure points in different components, whether again, it's solid state or vacuum tube gear. So I strongly suggest you go down that list and check out some of my videos. I'm sure there's something there that you're going to enjoy. There's all sorts of repairs and restorations there. So again, for those of you that haven't been subscribed and that you're new to the channel, this particular style of resistor here is known as a roundy style of resistor. This is known as a generic carbon composition style resistor. This is known also as a carbon composition style resistor, but it is an Allen Bradley style of resistor. How you tell the difference between the two? This kind of looks like the shape of a hot dog wiener with a lead sticking out of each end. These particular styles of resistors have a squared off end on each end. Now they come in all sorts of different sizes. You can see this would be known as an Allen Bradley style of resistor. And again, this resistor on the bottom is known as a roundy. You can see it's rounded on this end down here where this is nice and square. Now here's the thing. These particular styles of resistors are very susceptible to the environment that they've been stored in over the years. And we know through this video that this thing has not been in the optimal environment. The chassis was looking pretty bad and it was rusty and that black discoloration all over the place here. So we know 
that this thing has been stored in a pretty rough place. Now, as I've mentioned in some of my other videos, these particular resistors here are very, very susceptible to the area that they've been stored in. If this has been stored in a shed, in a damp location, or maybe beside a battery like this particular, you know, piece of test gear was over the years, these things here are going to get contaminated. And usually what ends up happening is they end up getting closer to being open. Now, when I say closer to being open, I mean that they're climbing in resistance. So here's a really good example of that. So this is a 100K ohm resistor here. We got brown, black, yellow. It's 100K, 104, okay? So if I put my lead here and my lead to this other end here, we can see that this is 226K. So that's over double what the resistance value of this is supposed to be. This should measure 100, right? This is a 68K ohm resistor. We got blue, gray, and then we have orange here. So that's 68K. It's 89, almost 90K. So this is a really good example of these particular resistors here being in a very bad environment. Now, as I've said before, this particular style of resistor, this Allen Bradley style of resistor, they're very stable no matter where they've been kept. It's always good to check all of them though, because again, these capacitors here, they leak. And now when I say they leak, that I mean that they're electrically leaking. Of course, this thing looks like it's been leaking wax, but they leak electrically. So what they do is they pass direct current through them. So basically these things themselves are turning into resistors. So these things are, are trying to turn into those things. Basically what's happening inside these things is they're degrading inside and they're just getting closer to being a short. They're turning into resistors. And over time these start leaking and then when the electrolytic caps fail they end up shorting and what they do when they short is they put a lot of load on these resistors and the resistors themselves go open. So we know that this particular resistor was across this cap here, so we would also want to check this. Now again, this is an Allen Bradley style of resistor, so these are very stable throughout time. So let's check this squared off version here. That's a 10K ohm resistor, and it's reading 9.5K. So that's great. In fact, it's uh, actually gone the other way. So very good. This here is a 10K ohm resistor here again. So we got brown, black, and orange, 103. So look at that, 10.0K. So now on the underside here, we have orange, 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 which is three, three, and three zeros. So that's 33K ohms. And again, this is a roundy style resistor. Let's see how accurate this larger roundy style resistor is. So that lead runs up to this terminal right here. So that's over double its value. So you can see the trend here, and this is a really good example of what happens with these roundies. Now here's the thing. You can find a chassis like this that's been stored in a nice warm attic for years, or maybe in a heated basement or something like that, and all the roundies will test fine. If they test fine, it's perfectly fine to leave them in if you want, but if you feel more comfortable in replacing them, it's your restoration. You do what makes you feel comfortable. If they're fine at that point and you start using the radio again and it's still kept in a controlled environment, chances are those resistors are gonna be just fine. And I've experienced this time and time again. They, they just remain the same. So again, you know that this has been kept in a very rough environment. So you can see the movement in all the roundies here. Like here's another one here. Let's just measure this one. So this is 2.7K. Let's see how much this one's moved, if it has. Yeah, it's 3.2. So it's moved up quite a bit as well. So you can really see the trend in this chassis here. So we would know that since we've tested a couple of these things and we see that they've moved up in value, using the best piece of test gear that we have, and that piece of test gear is right between our two ears, we're going to know that, okay, we've tested, say, one, two, three, and four. So if we were to test the other roundies and they're okay, I would still want to replace them just because I know the environment that this has been in. And if any of that contaminant has soaked into the body of these resistors, because they are kind of a porous resistor, there's a chance that it's going to fail. 
So again, I'll go over this in many of my future videos again, and I'll give you a lot of future references to the failure points in older test gear, whether it's, you know, the higher end Tektronix stuff or just a, you know, a standard piece of test gear like this. We'll go over it and I'll explain schematics and everything to you and show you all the different failure points. So my next job is to not only get rid of these capacitors, but I'm going to have to get rid of all of these roundy style resistors as well. So I've got a bit of a job ahead of me. These ones here are sealed and they're going to be absolutely fine. I'll go over them and test them and just make sure that they are absolutely fine. I'm pretty confident that they are. So I'll go over these and test these here in just a little bit individually. But you know, these don't very commonly fail. And quite some time later... The unit has been recapped and all the resistors have been changed and these are all the components down here. We'll take a look at some of the faulty components here on a tester quite shortly. So I wanted to clean this up the best that I could and as you know the tube sockets are here and a lot of the components have to go up to this wafer switch here into this tube socket so they were on an angle. So I just figured why not mount the new capacitors all on an angle as well here so it kind of keeps everything in this kind of direction, yeah, just clean it up a little bit. Do what you can with the layout that's provided, right? So everything is all solid and back into place, and I'm pretty much ready to try this thing out. But before we go and try this thing out, let's take a look at some of these components here first and see how badly they're failing. All right, let's test some of the capacitors that have been removed from this little signal generator and see how badly they're failing. In order to do that, we're going to need to stare deep into the magic eye. So this is a Heathkit model IT11 capacitor checker, and this here is a tuning indicator vacuum tube, so really it's a small CRT. And over the years, they've been used in many antique radios as either a tuning indicator or signal strength indicator. And over the years, they've also been used in pieces of test equipment like this, and various other pieces of test gear as well. So. Nice little tube. So what I'm gonna do is turn on the unit and when that vacuum tube here warms up, you'll see a green glow in there and you'll see a little opening in the bottom. Now, the way that this particular device works is it feeds a voltage out of these test clips here. So there's two little banana plugs at the bottom here and I've got some test leads plugged in. And what happens is, is I can source between three and 600 volts across the capacitors here. Now, of course, when you're testing a capacitor, you don't want to exceed the maximum voltage of the capacitor. What this thing does is it detects for leakage in these capacitors. So what happens with these capacitors is over time, they deteriorate inside and they start to turn into resistors. When they start to turn into resistors, they start to pass DC through them. And if this particular capacitor or any capacitor like this is in an audio amplifier or anything, usually what happens is you have one side that's connected to the plate. This is the outside foil end. You see it says outside foil. So this end is usually attached to the plate and then this goes to the grid of a next stage. If this particular capacitor starts to leak inside, what happens is the plate voltage that's applied at this side, say there's for argument's sake, 250 volts on this side. If this is turning into a form of a resistor, well, it's going to pass some of that voltage onto the grid of the vacuum tube in the next stage, changing its bias point, causing distortion and all sorts of things, driving the next stage, you know, into heavy class A, things like that. So it's very important to have good capacitors in whatever you own, whether they're the old caps like this or even modern caps. Capacitors are a failure point in many pieces of equipment. So this device here is designed to detect failure in paper and foil type capacitors. You can see it says here outside foil. So there's paper and foil in here. And really what's going on right now is the paper inside is deteriorating. And as it deteriorates, it turns this thing into a resistor. So it's at some particular resistive stage at this point, and it'll keep deteriorating eventually until this thing just shorts out. And usually how they do short is, of course, you have high voltage on one side, and this side is, you know, quite a bit lower, and they start to arc inside, and then, you know, they just end up shorting like that. And you can tell this one here has probably been warm. You can see the wax is starting to pop out of this end of the capacitor. See how it's in here and it's popping out. It's probably vented at some particular time. So at any rate, let's start testing these things. 
Now, since this particular device can source up to 600 volts, if you're unfamiliar with the Heathkit model IT11 capacitor checker or any other capacitor checker that can source 600 volts, you have to be very, very careful with these things because you can really hurt yourself. Now, one of the things with these older capacitor checkers is they really rely on you knowing what you're doing. You can see it says discharge and leakage. So right now it's in leakage. So now there's three volts across those two alligator clips that you see down there. Now there's 150 volts on those alligator clips. And now there's 600 volts across those alligator clips. And as you see, it's not spring-loaded. It's not popping into the discharge position. So a lot of people like these particular testers because they like to reform capacitors. And I'll explain that in just a little bit as well. So this device can be extremely dangerous, especially if it's left in the leakage position and you forgot that this is at the 600 volts. Because if you were to grab those clips right now, you would be in for a pretty nasty surprise. So if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Take extreme caution if you own any capacitor tester like this that will source any type of voltage. And of course, there is some current supplied there as well. So be very, very careful. So one really good rule of thumb, if you own one of these things is after you test your capacitor, of course, you always wanna click it to discharge to discharge the capacitor. And you wanna turn this right back down to the minimum voltage, especially if you put this thing away for a while. That way it's safe, you have it in the discharge and it's at a very low voltage. Just a couple things to keep in mind. So let's take a look at this capacitor first because it's kind of the ugly one. So this here is a wax coating that they've put on top of the capacitor and over years of this thing being inside an older piece of equipment, you know, there's wires laying on it. It's getting hot and cold and hot and cold and people have been poking at it with their screwdrivers and things and, and they end up you know, looking pretty ugly after a while, just like this one here. So. If this capacitor is leaking, this eye is going to remain closed. So when I click onto leakage, it will close for a minute. As it's closing, it's charging this capacitor. When the eye opens, it means that the capacitor has charged up. And as I increase the voltage, it'll keep doing that until the eye will not open anymore. If the eye does not open, it means that there is excessive leakage current. So here's an example. So I'm going to take my clips here. I'll put this on this end here, and this on this end here. And I'll just move this out of the way because I don't feel like holding this. Put that down there, get this cap out of the way. So I'll just lean it right there. So you can kind of see that out of focus, but on the side. This is the important part. We want to make sure this is in focus. So what I'm going to do is make sure this is on paper, mica, etc., because it's a paper capacitor. And I'm going to click this onto leakage. Now you can see the eye closing, it was charging, and now it's open at three volts. So now I'm gonna move up to six, wait for it to charge, and it opens again. 10. Getting slower, it's okay at 10. And that's getting pretty bad. It's probably gonna open here, it's gonna take a while, there we go. So, you know, 25 to 50 volts, this capacitor is going to be bad. Now the capacitor should charge a lot faster than it is because it's taking so long to charge. What does that tell us? Well, if you wanted to look at this, you could picture a resistor across this. That's really what's happening. It's stopping this thing from charging because it's basically self draining through its own internal resistance. So at 25 volts, that eye is not opening. So I'll click discharge, put this back down to three volts. Now, if we look at this capacitor here, you can see that it is rated at 400 volts and it's failing, you know, 25 volts is really bad. Now, of course it's failing before this because we can see how long it's taking for that particular eye to open. So I'll give you an example of a new capacitor. So this is a new one. This is 0.47 microfarad. So very close to that one was 0.5. This is 0.4 and this is rated at 630 volts. So I'll put this on the clips here. Just put this off to the side like this. So again, this capacitor is basically the equivalent to the one that we've just tested. So we're at three volts, click it on leakage. Look at how fast that is. 
So what I'm going to do is move this up to 150 volts, 250 we'll say, wherever it lands, and I'll just bring it right up to 600. Look at that. That's how quickly it opens. So discharge, and I'll click it onto leakage. Look at that, how fast that opens. That's a brand new capacitor with extremely low leakage, and that's how all capacitors should be. Now, any leakage in a capacitor is not a good thing. So if you say you found this thing, it was working up to say 350 volts or even 300 volts, this is rated for 400. So you can tell that, okay, if the eye isn't opening at say 300, but it's opening at 250, you know that this thing is in some form of deterioration and it should go if you leave that in a piece of equipment it is bound to fail now rule of thumb is nowadays anything with a wax coating on it you find in an old radio is just automatic get it out of there because these things are just you know they're prone to failure and as you can see this unit here let's move this out of the way i'm going to turn this back down to three volts and I'll move this out of the way here even though it's still on discharge you want to move that back down to three so you can see here, this is another wax capacitor, right? Sealed tight, sealed tight to keep the leakage in. So made by solar, and this is going to be very leaky too. I really don't even need to test this. I'll just give you an example here. Here's another one. So I'll put this off to the side. Another paper and foil type capacitor. So leakage. You see how it's jumping around like that? You know what that's telling us? Inside, it's sparking away. So I'll go back down to 50. There's a good chance that the capacitor could even be open. And by me turning it up to that point there, what ended up happening is it's basically trying to reconnect. So you can see how bad that is. You can almost use this as an oscillator. Look at that. It almost had a... A steady rate there so you can really see that this is just you know it's really bad look at this thing so yeah anyways it's just it's incredibly faulty so you know what that would be doing if this was left in there it would be you know open and trying to make connection again you'd have a staticky noise and if it was in an audio circuit your audio would be disappearing and coming back and doing all sorts of bad things if that did shorten it was connected to the grid of another tube that can you know destroy stages and if sections and things like that as well so just depending where on the circuit it is, IF, AF, or RF, wherever it is, it can you know really cause damage, especially if it causes the vacuum tube in the next stage to pull a lot of current. So whatever the next stage is attached to, if it's attached to, say, a transformer or a resistor, there's a good chance that it's going to open or burn out those components. So I'll click this to discharge here, move this back down. So we definitely know that... This capacitor is definitely toast. You see 600 volts, 0.25 microfarad. Sealed tight, paper capacitor. See, they mark the outside foil end on this one as well. So this is known as a paper and foil style capacitor. So we have some electrolytic capacitors here. Now these are a catch-22. Here's the catch with testing these capacitors with a device like this. The first time you put these things on this particular device, it's going to look like they're failing and you wait a while and all of a sudden the eyeball opens. So you bump the voltage up a little bit more. It looks like it's failing. And then the eyeball opens up here and you're like, what's going on? Well, what you're doing is you're reforming an old capacitor and reforming an old capacitor is not a good idea. Capacitors are cheap enough nowadays. Whenever you find an electrolytic like this, do not take the chance and leave it in a unit because what's going to end up happening is you're going to go grab yourself a cup of coffee. You're going to be listening to your favorite radio program. You're not going to pay attention. You're going to come back into the room. No radio program is playing and the room is full of smoke and the power transformer in your unit has burnt up or you've fried the rectifier tube. So do not take any chances with any type of old electrolytic capacitor because after all, it's only guaranteed for one year. So these are definitely going to be bad. So let's see if I can display this. So I'll make sure that this is on electrolytic here. I'm going to go to electrolytic because it's an electrolytic cap. 
I'll attach the leads. See if I can display what's happening. So hopefully this will do that particular reforming thing and I can display that to you. So we'll start at leakage here and we're down at three volts. So of course that capacitor is rated for much more than that. So we'll keep going up. You can see it getting slower. So that's at 300 volts. Now you can see that it's uh, slowly opening. There we go. Let's go to 350. And as you can see on these capacitors here, they are rated for 450 volts. Eight mics, 450 volts. So you can see we're at 350 and the thing doesn't want to open, but if we leave this thing attached like this for a long period of time, there's a good chance that that eyeball, oh, you can see it now, it's trying. So it'll sit here and you'll see that eye start to open. And basically what you're doing at this point is you're reforming these capacitors. Now, a lot of people think that reforming, again, is an okay thing to do because, hey, look, it looks like it's opening, right? Well, sometimes that eyeball will close just as quickly as it opens, meaning that the thing turned into a dead short, so it's never a good idea. I, I can't stress that enough. I see so many people repair older pieces of test equipment reforming capacitors, and they say, oh, it's absolutely fine. I've been doing it for years. Yeah. So at any rate, so you can see at 350, it's opened up. So if I do this at 400 now, it's going to do the same thing. Now, after this point, after I you know reform the capacitor here, hopefully this one here will behave through this whole procedure, you'll find that I can bring this up to 400 volts very quickly and it'll open very fast now because it has reformed somewhat. So this is you know, a time consuming procedure because this is current limited. It's not going to be passing a ton of current into these capacitors. And the reason that they do that is if something does go wrong, you don't want the capacitor exploding, right? So the whole thing is current limited. Now being current limited is it is still sourcing some current and there still is a chance that, you know, the capacitor could pop at any time, but you know, being limited, it's, you know, quite a bit safer. So this might have to be left in this position for a very long time. I'm not really too sure. So, or this could even just be, you know, showing up as leakage right now and it might not even change. It looks like I can see the little, little partition in the eye and it looks like it's very slowly moving backwards because the, the shadow angle overlaps a little bit and it is starting to move back. Well, we might actually see it open here in a little bit. It's getting closer and closer to opening. So there it is. Oh, it's trying. It's trying. You can see that. And we just about have a little crack in the middle. There we go. So it is reforming. There we go. Now, some people will leave these attached to capacitors for an extremely long time. And that's why these units are desirable is because many people want to try to do this to save the old capacitors. Again, not worth it. So you get the idea. So if I click discharge here, all right, so right now it's discharging the cap. That's why you saw that eye go closed for a moment and now it's discharged. So if I say, bring this back to 300 volts now and click it onto leakage. Look at how quickly that opened because it's technically reformed. So there's an example of reforming capacitors. Now this can be very tricky if you're testing for leakage because you're thinking the thing's leaking on the first go around. And technically when you're waiting for this thing to, you know, to indicate the leakage is going away, basically you're actually reforming it during your test. So you're kind of defeating your test. So lately, I've been seeing the prices of these types of capacitor testers absolutely skyrocket. It wasn't long ago that I could go to a, my local ham radio swap meet and pick one of these things up for between $10 and $50. And if I got the $50 version, the thing looked like it was mint out of the box with a bright green glowing eye. Now I'm seeing these things sell for $350, $400 plus. That's getting ridiculous. So I've had quite a few patrons ask me, Paul, can you design a device that's more cost effective? Let's face it. 
I don't want to design anything that's going to source 600 or in this case 500 volts. So I've been burning the midnight hours down here in the lab and I've come up with a solid design that tests these capacitors at a low voltage, a much safer voltage, and gets the same results these capacitor testers get at 600 volts. So for example, say I was to test this capacitor on this capacitor tester and it was showing leakage at 500 volts. You can see this is rated for 600 volts. The capacitor tester that I've designed will show that leakage at just over 20 volts. So a much, much safer design. Now I've showed this to some people and they say, Paul, you're crazy. You should be patenting this thing. It works that incredibly well. Let's face it. I'm all about safety and I'm just going to release it to my patrons and it's going to be released very soon with schematic and printed circuit board layouts and everything. If you wanted to build the basic version, you don't even need to put it on a circuit board. You can build it point to point. That's how incredibly simple this circuit is. If I was to show you the bucket of capacitors that I have gone through doing comparative tests, you would think I'm absolutely crazy. There are so many caps I have tested and of course spending time working everything else out as well. So I've shown this to some of my engineer friends and they are quite amazed as well. And I think you will be amazed when I show you how well this thing works in some upcoming videos. So you'll be seeing less of these things and a lot more of that little low voltage tester and it'll all sit in a very small little box and it'll have a nice little LED display on it and everything. So if you're interested in building something like this for yourself, head on over to Patreon. It'll be there very, very soon. There's a public video on Patreon right now with a parts list for the basic version of this. And there's a bit of a challenge going on. I'm seeing if any of the patrons can guess the schematic that I've designed and people are leaving their entries right now. So feel free to become a part of that and enter your schematic if you'd like as well. So this is all going to be coming very, very soon. The unit right now, I'm basically, it's ready to go. I'm just giving it more bells and whistles. I'm making it a little bit more basically creature friendly. That's it, I guess you could say. So some pretty neat stuff coming here very, very soon. So if you design guitar amplifiers or fixed guitar amplifiers or radios or televisions or older test gear, and you want a device that's much safer to use that, you know, tests capacitors around the 25 volt mark, you know, it's not testing them up at 600 volts anymore. You're going to want this device much, much safer to use than these things here. Let's take a closer look at ICO's design using their schematic. This really is a neat minimalist approach to an audio signal generator. And you know what? ICO was really good for that back in the day. ICO would design affordable pieces of test gear. So say you wanted to try your hand at repairing televisions, radios, or audio amplifiers, or you know, something electrical. You could go out and purchase one of these signal generators for a very reasonable and affordable price. Now, one of the things that gave the Model 377 the edge on the competition, and ICO was known for this, is this oscillator circuit right here. Many other pieces of test gear of this caliber back in the day did not use this oscillator. And this really is the secret sauce. In fact, this oscillator design is so good, it's still used today, except of course, it's solid state. Now, what I'm going to do is explain this here in just a moment. We'll move this way down the schematic. For you patrons out there, this is a really good example of your circuit recognition skills now. Now, on Patreon, we've designed the solid state version of this oscillator. The reason that we've designed the solid state version of this is because we're designing our own test gear up there for some future projects that we're doing. The reason that I chose this design, but the solid state version is because of its low distortion. And that's why it's still used today. In fact, I have a signal generator right now on my bench that uses this design. Again, of course, being solid state. The key to recognizing this circuit is this right here. There's a light bulb in the oscillator circuit. If that isn't enough to recognize this circuit, you can see that we have a selector switch over here with four resistors here that are placed in series with these variable capacitors. 
And on this half here, we have four resistors that are selectable, again, that are placed in parallel with these capacitors here. This switch is ganged together. Now, when you hear the word ganging, that means that these are connected together, but there is no real connection to the shaft. They've ganged them or connected them together. So when you turn one shaft, it's moving these along like this. Now, ganging doesn't mean complete isolation. These capacitors here are ganged together. The capacitors themselves are separated, but there is one common section to the capacitors here. So many of these capacitors that you see will have one common section that's tied together, and you'll see that that's basically the frame of the capacitor because there's a bunch of plates that are connected to the rotor or to the center portion, the shaft of the capacitor. So those all have to be connected because they're kind of pressed into the center connection. So you can see the common connection between all four of these capacitors. Now that worked out very well for that air variable on the top side of the chassis. These four capacitors are the four sections in that air variable. Since the outer, the outer case of that capacitor has to be lifted from the chassis, it has to be isolated, the case itself runs over to the grid of this tube right here. This is the control grid inside this tube. All the other portions of the capacitors are running out to little, they're like little porcelain tabs or little ceramic tabs that are pressed into the capacitor here. And when we take a look at the design again here and try it out, I'll point all this stuff out and I'll show you how this is ganged together and everything. This here is just a small trimmer capacitor and this is designed to align the scale on the face. So there's that pointer on the face. So we want to align that. So when it, you know, say points to two kilohertz, we want it to be at two kilohertz, right? So just a trimmer capacitor here. These are all ganged together. These are ganged together. And this switch over here is ganged together as well. Again, this is usually denoted by a dotted line. They don't have a dotted line on here. I guess they're just taking for granted that you, you should know that they're ganged together. I, I really don't know. Some schematics, they, they do different things in schematics. I.e., for example, you'll see a suppressor grid in this tube and it's not hooked to anything. Why haven't they hooked it to anything? because they take for granted that you should know the suppressor grid in the 6K6 is tied to the cathode. Same with this 6K6 tube here. You see that there's no connection. It's just tied to the cathode internally. Little things like that. When you start looking at these schematics more often, you, you pick these things up. So at any rate, back to the oscillator design here. This oscillator design is known as a Veenbridge or Weenbridge oscillator if you prefer. Again, the thing that really gives it away is the light bulb that's in the oscillator circuit. Now, here's a catch for a lot of people that find these oscillator circuits and they see a light bulb and they power the thing up and the light bulb doesn't glow. Well, it's not supposed to. This light bulb is just acting as a resistor with a positive temperature coefficient. All right, so to explain that a little better... If you have a light bulb and you measure the resistance across a filament style light bulb that's known as an incandescent style light bulb, when the filament is cold, the resistance is low. If you heat the filament up inside that light bulb, the resistance will go high. So you can see in this circuit when there's current on the cathode line here, what's going to happen? The filament inside this light bulb is going to get warm and it's the resistance is going to go higher. What is that doing? It's acting as an automatic gain control, like an automatic leveling control in this circuit. So kind of neat. That's just a, a, a feature of an incandescent light bulb. Now, this design, again, is still widely used today with op amps, and you can get surprisingly low distortion out of a very, very simple circuit. Now, I've designed a really low distortion, and I've even given the distortion specs and everything up on Patreon. So if you're interested in designing an audio oscillator for testing purposes or something like that, you're going to want to check that out. And I also even provide the math and show you how to work out the resistor and capacitor combinations to determine your frequency. It seems like everybody on the internet wants to complicate that math procedure. So I simplify it and make it very, very simple. And you can just work it out on any regular calculator very quick. So at any rate, that's all up on Patreon. So I could spend a lot of time in the circuit here and explain the circuit, but we'd be here for a very long time. 
here's another little neat thing about incandescent light bulbs. Okay, so say you had an incandescent light bulb and you were to break the glass on that incandescent light bulb and you were to apply a little bit of current across the filament. So the filament really isn't glowing, but you know, it's, it's getting a little bit warm, okay? So if you blow air across that filament that, of that broken light bulb, the resistance is going to go low. If you reduce the airflow passing that filament, the resistance is going to climb again because the, the filament's going to try and heat up again. What do we have? We have the design for the mass airflow sensor in your car. That's how a mass airflow sensor works in, in pretty much every car. They've got little filaments that are strung in the air path. And what happens is, is they're supplied with some constant current. So it's pretty much a regulated voltage source across the little filaments. And what happens is they get nice and warm. When you start your engine up, air starts to run past it. The resistance changes and they have you know, an op amp and a bunch of things in there that basically take that resistance change and turn it into a voltage change. And your ECU is programmed to recognize basically the different voltages that are developed through that resistance change. It's a very simple circuit. So anyways, that's what the, this is kind of the sealed version of that. I guess you could say there's no air blowing across it, but you know, if you let the thing alone and because it's not really glowing it cools off very quickly, just because the, the actual filament itself is sunk to the little lead in wires and things like that. Everything inside that light bulb plays a role in how this will work in this circuit. So believe it or not, when you're designing a circuit like this, a lot of thought goes into that, you know, because of things like thermal inertia. Anyways, we'll get into all that stuff here in the future. Over here, we see the negative feedback path. This is that VR on the top side of the chassis that had paint plastered all over it and to chip all that stuff off. It was kind of a gummy substance. Anyways, it cleaned all that off. This is the negative feedback path. It goes through that variable resistor and back down to the cathode here. The light bulb is attached from this vacuum tube right here. So anyways, moving on, we have a nice clean sine wave at this point right here. The switch is in the sign position, not in the square position. So you can see it bypasses this waveform shaping network right here. So you can see it goes up here, over here. We have a nice sine wave present at this VR. This VR is the gain control on the face of the unit. The wiper of that gain control goes through a blocking capacitor and into the control grid of this 6K6 pentode vacuum tube. Again, this grid not being attached to anything here internally, it's attached to the cathode. So the signal is going into the control grid. You'll notice that we have the plate of the vacuum tube or the anode of the vacuum tube tied to the screen grid here. This is known as triode connecting a pentode. And you'll see this in a lot of high-end amplifier applications and, and designs. You'll see that we have the cathode here and the signal is coming out of the cathode and it's tied to the jack on the front of the unit through a 20 microfarad capacitor. Now there's a bunch of reasons that they're using this design in this circuit. One is because of this. And another thing is we don't want any iron in the path. So in other words, we don't want any transformers in the path. Anytime you introduce a transformer into the path of any kind of a signal, you're adding a bandwidth limiting device. Now, of course, this thing has to be really broad. We're dealing with, you know, from the low hertz way up into the high kilohertz. So the last thing we want is an audio transformer or something like that in here. Even a very broad audio transformer is still going to be limited at the top end or at the bottom end. So what's the best way to keep the signal integrity, to keep that sine wave nice and clean and to keep that square wave nice and square? don't have any iron in there, use a cathode follower circuit. So this is acting as a buffer circuit and have the signal go through this capacitor, which is, you know, 20 microfarad. That's some pretty stout coupling to this output jack here. So this is a really low impedance circuit and we're going to keep that signal integrity at this point here. Again, there's no bandwidth limiting iron or anything in this circuit. What you see here is just a biasing network for the control grid here. This resistor that you see on this side of the capacitor is acting to discharge the capacitor. So you can see that it will discharge through this path right here. If we didn't have this resistor that's acting as a discharge and somewhat of a load, what would end up happening is this capacitor would charge up if the jacks were left open and you'd be zapping your equipment. So that's the reason that this thing is here. 20 microfarad will hold quite a charge at this voltage that you see right here. So, 
All in all, this is known as a triode connected pentode cathode follower circuit. There you go, that's a mouthful. Now this here is a waveform shaping network. So if we move this switch, remember this is gang together. If we move this switch from sine to square wave, we're gonna take our nice sine wave and put it down this path right here, somewhat of a divider. We're gonna have a nice sine wave here. Because we have grid current present, present at this point here, if we take a look at the sine wave, we're gonna notice that the top portion is starting to flatten off, and that's because we have grid current present at this point. So just from this point of the resistor to this point of the resistor right here, we're already starting to form a square wave. Now from my vacuum tube explanations, earlier, if you've seen my earlier videos, you're going to know that the signal is going to be 180 degrees out of phase at the plate. And because of this network down here, we're going to start to square off the bottom portion of that of that now kind of modified sine wave. So now we're, we've got a pretty square top and we're starting to square off the bottom half. Once it goes through this portion of the vacuum tube, that's enough to finish squaring everything off. And we have a nice square wave present at this point. Because this is coupled to this portion here, again, remember this arrow is going to be pointed down here, we're going to be feeding a square wave into this vacuum tube here. And again, we want to keep the integrity of that square wave, and that's why we have a buffer circuit here and a cathode follower. You can see if we were just to take this signal, and basically if we didn't have the circuit and feed it right to the output jack, any load on this point would change the oscillator, because you can see we have resistors right over here and we also have our feedback network right here. So we need to isolate this from the output jack and that's another reason we have this cathode follower here. This is acting somewhat like a buffer as well. So if we move down here, we have a pretty standard power supply topology. We have a full wave rectifier set up here. The center tap is grounded. The outer ends of the windings here go to the plates in the 6x5 rectifier. This is known as an indirectly heated rectifier tube here. There's lots of different types of vacuum tube rectifiers. Now when I say indirectly heated, that means that there's a filament that goes up inside a pipe inside of this rectifier tube. So the filament isn't directly heated. The filament itself isn't the cathode. There's a cathode pipe inside here. Now 6x5s are known to be troublesome. There's an X plate and a wing plate type of 6x5 that's been in use for many years. The X plate is a little safer than the wing plate design. The wing plate design was known to destroy many Zenith radios and things like that just because of heater to cathode shorts. So if you're uncomfortable using the 6X5, you could replace this with just a bunch of, you know, 1 and 4007s or something like that in the circuit and you'd be absolutely fine. I'm going to leave the 6X5 in there because I'm really not too worried about it. So we have 300 volts at this point. We have a, a pi filter network here. So if you want to understand a pi network, if you were to take the two grounds and just tie them together through this co or through the uh, this uh, choke right here or reactor, you'd see that we have something that looks like a pi symbol. That's really what it is. One easy way to remember it. So we have C, L, and C here. So this is the filter right at the cathode. We have a reactor, or choke if you'd like to call it that here, and then we have another filter over here, so we have nice clean DC here, and this is applied to this entire circuit. Now, if we wanted to improve this design even more, we could add a regulator tube over here, you know, something like a, you know, um, an OC3, or if you wanted to be fancy, OB3 or OA2 or something like that. You put a, uh, you know, a, a regulator tube, OA2 or is it? Yeah, it's an OA2. There's also an OA3 tube and all sorts of different kinds of tubes that they use for some for rectification and one for uh, regulation. And OZ4, if I remember correctly, is a, is a rectifier tube. At any rate, so we could regulate this and that would make this oscillator even more stable than it is. So we could keep improving this design, but again, this is a minimalist approach. And you know what? It works very, very well. These particular designs, anything that Ico put together always worked very well. Just from what I can see on the schematic already, I know that this is going to be a very solid design. One other thing. Now, because of the nonlinear characteristics of the 6SN7, it is a really good choice to use this as a, you know, a tube for, you know, squaring off that sine wave. If to say you were to add a 6SL7 in here or something like that, it wouldn't work as well, right? Even though the pinout is the same. Now, here's the thing. You're not going to ever get a really, really perfect square wave out of this thing. You know, you're not going to have really fast rising and, you know, falling if you were to look at this thing on a scope. So 
Again, it's a minimalist design. It'll produce a decent square wave, but if you're looking for, you know, a, a really nice, clean, fast square wave, you know, this really isn't the circuit for this. Now we're going to experiment with the square wave here down the road. This is going to go onto the antique workbench or the old time workbench. And this is going to be a, a piece of the test gear there as well as an ICO oscilloscope and as well as an ICO VTVM and all sorts of things. We have a lot of really neat projects coming up here on this channel. So at any rate, I'm going to use this thing as it's designed because that's the fun of using this older test gear. We want to restore it and use this stuff like the way it was intended to be used way back in the day. So I'll show you how to use this square wave. The square wave uh, in audio signal generators like this was used to test audio amplifiers. So you would feed a square wave into the audio amplifier and look at the signal integrity at the output jack of the audio amplifier and determine how well your amplifier is performing. And again, we'll look at all of that here in the future. I would have to say 99% of the time, this is going to stay in the sine wave position. We're going to be using the sine waves out of this thing. And I think for, you know, in most applications, unless you're, you know, doing something pretty specialized, it's pretty much going to live in the sine wave position. So there you go. All in all, it looks like a really solid design and I'm looking forward to using this thing in the future. Now, keep in mind, if you're working on a piece of equipment like this, there is high voltages present all over this thing. As you can see, there's 300 volts DC coming out of this rectifier and we have 275 volts AC at this end and we have 275 volts AC at this end. So we have a lot of voltage from end to end here. To the center tap, it's 275. So it's 275 from here to here and 275 from here to here, all right? So a lot of voltage from end to end if we're to avoid this center tap. You gotta be very, very careful around circuits like this. If you haven't worked on any type of vacuum tube gear before, I strongly suggest that you research this stuff before you get into it just because you really don't want to get zapped. It really is unpleasant and, you know, it can be very, very dangerous. So if you're following along, you're working on one of these things, you're definitely doing so at your own risk. Take extreme caution when you're inside these things. At this point, I'm pretty much ready to try out this little audio signal generator. Here's the thing. When I replaced all the components on the underside of the chassis, I've just put the new components to where the old components were. I haven't compared anything to the schematic, so I'm basically trusting the guy before me to have repaired or assembled this thing correctly. So there's a good chance that it might not fire up. It might not be an audio signal generator, but it might be a great smoke generator. So let's find out here shortly. At any rate, no big deal. If the thing doesn't work, we'll just make it work. It really doesn't have a choice. So before we get into that, let's check out this air variable that I was explaining to you earlier. I'll just zoom on into this here and I'll explain what I mean by ganging and everything. So this here is that air variable, four section air variable. And when I turn the shaft here, you can see that these four sets of plates move in and out of these ones here. So these ones here move and these ones here are stationary. Now, the ones that move are ganged together by a common shaft. This common shaft is isolated from this common shaft by this little flex coupler right here. The reason that this has to be isolated from this shaft here is because the frame of the capacitor is tied to the grid of this tube. Now, that it's fastened to the chassis here, if I back out on the focus here just a little bit, you can see on the chassis that there's some little spacers Right? So this is standing the capacitor off the chassis. This cannot make contact with the chassis. If it does, of course, it's going to short the grid to ground and the thing isn't going to work. So the entire frame of this capacitor is attached to these right here because you can see the shaft comes through a ball bearing and there's little fingers on each one of these little separators here that make contact to this to make sure that there's really good contact in the capacitor or it could act up at higher frequencies. So you can see the precision of this device. I'll just really zoom on into this here. And there we go. Now, if I rotate this like this, you can see those plates are going inside of these plates right here. Now, throughout the entire travel here, these sets of plates here can never touch these. So these can never touch these in each section, but they can get very, very close. 
And because they're very, very close and they don't touch, they're forming a capacitor. These are these little ceramic buttons that you see that are pressed into this steel frame. You can see how they've pressed them in right around here. So I'll just move the camera just a little bit so it'll really focus in on that for us. You can see how they've got little press marks here from some form of a press, pressing the ceramic button into the steel frame. That alone would be a pretty precision job. Can you imagine just a little bit too much pressure and this thing would burst or crack? Now, these things here go through and they're soldered to this right here and it holds the stationary portion of this capacitor in place. And that again is a, you know, a, a real precision setup. If that's over just a touch, these plates will touch. So, and that would make a short. So you can see the precision involved and way back in the day, this was a very pricey piece. And in pretty much any radio receiver, that was always a very pricey piece. Now, if we move over here, move down just a little bit, that capacitor that you see is a trimmer capacitor and that is what's used, I'll back this out just a little bit, that's what's used in aligning the dial scale on the face here. So you can see this little pointer here. This has to point to the correct frequencies. So basically what this is doing is that's trimming this big one up so that when I say I want to point this to two kilohertz, if this is pointing to two kilohertz, we want two kilohertz present on the output jacks over here. Another thing I should mention is down here, you see right down there, you'll notice that I've mounted the new capacitor on the underside of the chassis down here. So I'll just move this in just a little bit and I'll move this over. So you can see right there, I've just run a wire from the new capacitor. I've put a standoff here. So this is an isolated standoff. The reason I've done this is the old capacitor sat right alongside this 6K6 tube and it is a maraca. Let's see, where did I put that thing? If I've got it over here, I think I may have. There it is. So what I'm gonna do is try and shake this thing by the microphone. So this is the old capacitor and it was sitting right alongside through that hole there. Let's see if I can make this make any noise in the microphone here. You can hear how dried out this thing is. Hear that? That's the, basically in the internals of this capacitor, you know, going around. Now it is already, you know, a dry elect electrolytic capacitor, but now it's extremely dry. Like this is, you know, just absolutely faulty at this point. So at any rate, the new capacitor is on the underside of the chassis and it's below the vacuum tube and there's just a wire that runs up from here. So I'm keeping it away from the heat. So, you know, a couple of little design modifications there. So what we have to do is align, if the thing works to begin with, we have to align this here. And then on the other side, just move this over. See that right down there? We have to adjust that VR on the bottom. And we're going to use an oscilloscope to do this. We don't need to do it the way that they suggest in the manual. This, you know, their original alignment procedure was taking into, you know, account that most people didn't have frequency counters back in the day. And we have that now so we can really simplify the alignment procedure for this thing. So, so that's what we're going to tackle next. We'll get in here. And first of all, we'll see if this thing basically starts up. So what I'm going to do is get the, you know, this thing hooked up to my Variac in isolation transformer, and I'll bring this thing up very slowly and we'll very carefully watch the light bulbs to make sure that they don't glow brightly. All right, let's find out if this thing is a signal generator or a smoke generator. So I've got the oscilloscope set to where it should be, and I've got the dial pointer just pointing straight up and down here. It's on sine wave. I got about the amplitude controls about halfway up on the face here and I'm on band C so that should correspond with where I am on the time base on the oscilloscope here. So what I'm going to do is turn on the isolation transformer and variac supply. So we'll just move you over here and we'll take a look at this here. So the variac is down, it's on current limit and I'm gonna turn this thing on right now. So what we'll do is keep an eye on the bulbs on the top. So I'm going to advance the Variac now. So I'll bring it to 85 volts. That's 85 volts right there and we should see a slight glow. And that's fine. That means that you know, the thing is 
drawing just a little bit here. You can see, you see the light is lighting up in the unit itself. So that's a really good sign. If that light wasn't coming on, there'd definitely be something wrong. So now, as I advance the variac, you see these things light up some more. So I'll just bring this thing right up to the top. And the glow of those light bulbs is fine. No problems. If these things were blazing bright, there would be an issue. They look a little brighter in the camera than they actually are. Time for me to do some dusting here. Wow. At any rate, it adds the old look. At any rate. So now, what I'm going to do is just bypass this because it looks like the signal generator is fine. I don't see any smoke. And hey, look at that on the screen. There's a sine wave. Well, that's a good sign. Wave. All right. Zoom on in here. Look at that. No problems. So if I bypass this, obviously the voltage is going to go higher and I should probably see an amplitude increase. Let's see here. It is now through. And everything is warming up. Yeah, there we go. That's looking like a really nice sine wave too. So we're off to a good start. Let's try the square waves. Here we go. This should be interesting. Hey, look at that. Those are some really nice square waves. Not bad at all. So let's move to different ranges here. Put this back to the sign. We'll go down to range B. Make sure all the ranges are working. And it looks like they are. No problems. Go down to range A. There we go. No problems. Let's go to the highest range here. And I'll move this up here. And there it is. No problems up at 54 kilohertz right now or something like that. Let's move the amplitude control around. Hey. And move the variable cap. All looking good. So move it right through its throw to make sure there's no shorts. And no shorts. Boy, we're really off to a good start here. So the next thing we need to do is align this thing now. Everything's working great. This is the simplified alignment procedure for this ICO Model 377 audio signal generator. Remember, this unit has high voltage all over it, so if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. If you're unsure of what you're doing, do not do this. Make sure the unit is switched off. Make sure the band switch is in the band B position. Make sure that the waveform switch is in the sign position. Make sure the amplitude is at its maximum. Put a 1K ohm resistor across the output jacks. Now, if you remove the knob for the main tuning capacitor here, you want to make sure that it's aligned properly mechanically. So first of all, when you put the knob back on, you want the actual little black line in the pointer to align up with this line here when it's fully meshed. When the capacitor is fully open, the black line on the pointer should line up perfectly with this line right here. Once that's done, it's mechanically aligned. At that point, you want to take this and point it right at the 200. So you want it right in the middle of the 200 on the band B scale here. So once that's done, we're ready to turn the unit on and take a look at an oscilloscope. The next thing to do is put your oscilloscope probe across this 1K ohm resistor right here. I've got my oscilloscope probe attached on the back side. It was just an easy place to attach it, but it is across that 1K ohm resistor. The first adjustment we're going to make is the dial scale tracking. So we know the dial pointer on the face of the unit is pointing at 200 cycles, so we want 200 cycles present at the output jack. If there is a difference between the two, we will make an adjustment to this capacitor right here and make them the same. Now you don't need to get incredibly accurate with this. You know, if you're at, you know, 201 or 199 cycles, it's absolutely fine. So what I'm going to do now is turn the unit on, wait for it to warm up, 
and I'm going to use this insulated screwdriver to make the adjustment here. So we'll take a look at the oscilloscope screen. Again, it is a good idea to let your unit warm up for a while. And I'll just zoom on into this. So now, I want to adjust this so the frequency here reads 200 hertz. And as you can see, it is off just a little bit. So I'll put my insulated screwdriver into the adjustment here, and I will adjust this. Right now I'm tightening it up. So you can see I'm at 199 or 200. It's a little bit of movement there, not bad. So 200.4. As I say, you don't need to get too incredibly accurate. I'll move this down just a little bit more, give it a touch jumping around a little bit because of the screwdriver and me moving that around. Let's see if I can get it down just a little bit more. About there. Now I'm getting really close. I'm just being finicky right now. Again, when this thing warms up, that's close enough. When this thing warms up, it's gonna move around just a little bit anyways. So that's adjusted. Just that simple. The next thing we wanna do is adjust that potentiometer that's on the top side of the chassis there. So. In the instructions or the alignment procedure, it says to align that to between 10 and 11 volts RMS. So what I'm gonna do is put my screwdriver, insulated screwdriver, down into that VR right here, and I'm going to just adjust that. Now remember the amplitude control has to be maximum on the face. So I'll just adjust this up. As you can see, it jumps around a little bit. So between 10 and 11 volts. So let's say 10.5, let's adjust it for there. It is a really finicky adjustment. Let's see here. I'm just touching the control to make it do this right now. That's close enough, 10.5. They say between 10 and 11 volts. And there it is. That's it, it's aligned, it's ready to use. Here's the completed ICO Model 377 audio signal generator back in its case. And I have to say, I'm very pleased with the results. In fact, I even gave the case another coat of paint and it turned out great. Oh, wait a minute. We need to have the red jewel light glowing. So this was a real time-consuming restoration. This one here kind of went above and beyond having to strip the chassis and everything like that. But it's worth it because it's going to have a permanent home on the old-time workbench. So now I'm on to restoring the next piece for that bench. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Hope you enjoyed this episode involving this audio signal generator. If you did enjoy the video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos coming like this in the near future. There's lots and lots of test gear to repair yet. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a different and very effective way, you might want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll have the link just below this video in the description, and I may pin it at the top of the comments section as well. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.